Hello there. In this lesson, we're going to look more closely at the differences between ionic and molecular compounds. On the left hand picture here, you can see some uh, table salt mixed with some other uh, blue crystals. And through the little microscope, you can see this nice crystalline shape of uh, the clear ones here are sodium chloride crystals, like from a salt shaker. And the blue ones here are called uh, bluestone sometimes. They are copper sulfate and it's a hydrated salt. Uh, you can see the blue color there. It's because of the water and the copper that, that give you that color. And on the right hand side here, we have uh, some models representing uh, different molecules. You've got good old water here on the top and we've got a more complex one here, uh, ethanol on the, on the bottom here. And so those are made of plastic, which are also molecules as well. And so we're going to look at a little more closely some of the differences between them, like the crystalline structure of the salt versus this more um, smooth and uh, softer structure of, of uh, the plastic. So let's consider some substances from around the home and see if we can discern whether they're ionic or molecular. Um, first of all, we have good old baking soda. Baking soda has a formula NaHCO3. And because you see a metal in there with some nonmetals, uh, you probably would guess that that is ionic. And you would be right. Uh, down here we have the uh, gas stove in the kitchen. And this is burning methane, which has a formula of CH4. And you would say that is molecular. And then we got good old table salt here. Uh, and so that has a formula of NaCl, the sodium again, ionic. Uh, up here we have ammonia. Ammonia has a formula of NH3, which makes it molecular. Vegetable oil, um, you can see it's this uh, liquid, kind of a viscous liquid uh, that you might use for cooking or in salad dressings, that sort of thing. And uh, what its formula is like is these long chains of carbon and hydrogen with a few oxygens in there, um, et cetera. Uh, we can get more into those structures a little later on. In fact, the plastic jug is also uh, made of like long chains of carbon and hydrogen and some oxygens in there as well. So we'll learn about uh, some of those molecules later. But suffice it to say, when you see carbons and hydrogens, et cetera, those are going to be molecular. Last one we're looking at here is good old sugar. Um, the sugar that's in here is called sucrose, um, which is a disaccharide. So it'd have a formula somewhere around uh, C12, H24O12 ish. And, uh, and again, this is a mo molecule. So you can see right away uh, that our ionic uh, representatives here are these nice crystals or powders. Whereas the molecules have a range, we have uh, a gas, we have uh, two solutions here. Well, um, ammonia is a solution, so it's a molecule dissolved in a molecule. Uh, we have uh, oil, which is a molecule, and we've got a solid when it comes to the sugar. So it's more of a range when it comes to molecules. So why are some element combinations ionic and others molecular? Um, the answer is the electronegativity of the elements. And uh, you can see here, uh, if you recall, the electronegativity increases to the right and to the top of your periodic table. Fluorine's the most, francium's the least. And so if you subtract the electronegativity uh, of two elements that are bonded together, you can tell whether or not the bond will be ionic or covalent by the difference in the electronegativity values. The cutoff of 50% ionic character is at 1.7. So uh, for example, if you take water and get the difference in electronegativity, that's what the little delta EN means, um, you end up with 1.4 as the difference. And that puts it in this range, which means you have covalent bonds inside the water molecule. If you look at the difference in electronegativity of sodium chloride, uh, the difference between the sodium and the chlorine puts it at about 2.1, which is definitely in ionic bond territory. So that's a quick way to be able to tell uh, whether or not the bonds will be covalent or ionic between two elements in a compound. So if you've ever played around with any salts, like table salt or bath salts, you probably notice that they're very hard uh, crystals. Um, if you hit them with a hammer, you can crack them, but uh, you're not going to be able to squish them between your fingers. 
They also uh, don't melt very easily. Uh, you're going to have to heat them up way hotter than you can easily do, say, on a frying pan in your cook stove uh, to get them to melt. Um, and they also don't really conduct electricity very well as solids. But if you could melt them, get them hot enough, or dissolving them in, in water, which is a lot easier, they will conduct electricity. So that's, uh, those are main observations of ionic compounds. So those properties of ionic compounds can be explained using the structure uh, of the compounds. So if you recall, uh, one element is going to give up its electrons to the other. In this case, it's sodium, it gives up an electron, ends up with a positive charge. Chlorine picks up that electron, ends up with a negative charge. And because you have this uh, oppositely charged ions, they're going to be attracted to each other. And it's not just two of them, it'll be kajillions of them. That's the technical term, kajillions. Um, you're going to have sodium ions and chlorine ions forming this nice repeating pattern uh, in three dimensions that we call a lattice. And it's that very strong three-dimensional pattern that gives um, ionic compounds their strength as a solid. Uh, that's what makes them so hard to, to squish or to melt uh, because those bonds are very strong. So that lattice of ions that are held so tightly together does not allow for electricity to be conducted through ionic solids uh, hardly at all. Um, but if you dissolve ionic compounds in water, or if you can melt them, get them hot enough for that, uh, you will find that it does conduct. So I, I did a little example here, an experiment, uh, where I took some pure deionized water and, uh, and made a little um, circuit uh, using a power supply. And we've got uh, two, um, you can see one of the leads there and the other one's kind of warped by the water there. And so we got two leads uh, under this pure water and you can see that the light bulb isn't on and electricity is not being conducted through that, uh, that liquid. So water isn't a terrific conductor of electricity until you dissolve some ions in it. Now, usually there's lots of ions, whether it's from the pipes that the water travels through or the land that the water might flow over to get to a lake. And if you dissolve a little bit of salt in there, those ions, the NAs and the CLs, they can carry a charge from one place to another and make the water uh, very conductive. Uh, what happens at the you know, microscopic level is that um, if you have uh, a charge here and it's negatively charged over here and positively charged over here, that's going to attract the positively charged ions in the solution and they'll pick up those electrons and the chlorine here will also be attracted to the positive side and they'll drop off electrons. So even though it's not the same electrons moving through the solution, um, the ions can carry the charge from one place to another. They'll pick them up here and drop them off here. And even though it's separate ions, the net effect is that electrons are going to keep flowing. So now let's look at uh, some molecular compounds. Um, first of all, you probably noticed that for molecules, there is a whole lot more variation, right? Um, so you got molecules that are a gas, like uh, this butane that comes out of this lighter. If you push the little button here, it'll go and you'll, you know, it's invisible, but you'll hear the gas leaving and uh, that's a molecule. Or it could be liquid, like this candle wax that melted underneath the, the light or this vegetable oil. Those are both molecular substances or solids like the solid wax or this solid uh, sugar here. So a big range of, uh, of uh, states that you can have for molecular compounds. Um, some of them are hard, like the sugar crystals. Some of them are pretty soft, like the wax. Um, other things might be the plastics that are all around us. Those are all molecular substances or things like wood, uh, which are a lot harder um, that are around. Uh, they will have a range of boiling points, but all significantly lower than, than the ionic compounds. Uh, that means that uh, the particles are not as held as tightly to each other and you can break them apart with the heat. And lastly, the conductivity is pretty bad uh, because they don't have ions that even in water can be freed up to move very easily. Um, so, so they don't uh, conduct electricity very well. Now, one reason for the variety of different types of molecules is that there's some variation in the types of covalent bonds that exist between the atoms in a molecule. Uh, the 
purest type of covalent bond is when two elements uh, are sharing electrons completely equally. Uh, we call that a pure covalent bond. And, and that means that the elements have to have the same electronegativity. So of course, if you have two fluorines, no one fluorine is stronger than another fluorine at attracting um, electrons. So when these two share a pair of electrons, it's going to be completely equally between them. Uh, same with two oxygens, right? If you've got two oxygens with their double bond between them, uh, they'll be sharing the electrons completely equally. So all of these, all your Hofbrinkel elements, of course, are going to have uh, pure covalent bonds between them, and they're going to end up with slightly different properties than the ones that have a variation in electronegativity. Even if that variation isn't powerful enough to make them ionic, it still causes some difference in, this, in these substances. So let's look at those two. When the difference between the electronegativity of elements is slightly different, you can end up with what's called a polar covalent bond. Polar covalent bonds have one element that's a bit more electronegative than the other, and what that does is it pulls or attracts electrons more to that side of the bond. So a good example here is hydrogen bonded to fluorine. Fluorine is quite a bit more electronegative than hydrogen, and what happens is you end up with a partial negative charge on the side with the fluorine and a partial positive charge on the side with the hydrogen. And, uh, and so this is called a dipole. Um, it's kind of like uh, with magnets having a north and south pole, only this is a negative and positive pole. Uh, and you can represent it with an arrow. The arrow always points toward the negative end. You can put a little cross on the other end that reminds you that that side is positive. So this is a dipole. And we say that uh, bonds that uh, have a dipole are polar. Now, this can cause the whole molecule to be polar as well. Uh, but that will depend on some other factors as well that we'll get to. So first off, we just want to be able to identify bonds that have this dipole property and notice that that's going to make them polar. Uh, the, the difference in electronegativity where the, the cutoff is for this is around uh, 0.4. So anything below that would be all your Hofbrinkel elements um, that, uh, that bond together totally equally and a few others that have very near electronegativity. And then above that, in between there and the 1.7 where we call it ionic, that's what we call polar covalent bonds. Alrighty, so let's have a look at a few uh, bonds and see if we can decide if they're polar or nonpolar. So first off, we got H and Cl. So we'll look up the electronegativity of chlorines over here. It looks like 3.16. So we got 3.16, and then we'll subtract the electronegativity of hydrogen, which is 2.20. And what we'll end up there is 0 0.96. So that puts us in uh, this range somewhere around here, which means we got ourselves a polar covalent bond. Polar covalent. Great. Now, carbon and hydrogen make up so many molecules. Um, organic chemistry is full of... Uh, carbon and hydrogen molecules. And so let's look at the difference in electronegativity here. Uh, for the carbon, it's 2.55. And for the hydrogen, it's 2.20. And this electronegativity difference is then 3, 0.35, which means this is nonpolar. That means there's a whole lot of molecules with carbon and hydrogen that are all nonpolar, uh, covalently bonded. Right, so um, so this is all just the bonds that we're looking at. Uh, later on, we're going to look at uh, the other factor that's going to decide whether a whole molecule is going to be polar or non-polar, <laughs> and that is the shape of those molecules. So that's gonna, coming up in lessons to come. All right, great job, guys. We'll see you soon.